Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about shallow hazards. Identify shallow hazards using seismic data for safe drilling for safe installation of offshore structures. So there are many types of different hazards, and I'll talk about uh, most of them in a minute. Uh, but the key point here is that you're looking at the top 100 to 200 meters of uh, the subsurface below seabed. I'm going to talk about marine data today. Uh, the, there is also some of these techniques that are applicable to land data, but uh, marine data is where I have most experience. And some of these hazards are also a problem for foundations of large-scale offshore wind turbines. Again, you're looking 100 meters below seabed. Some of these wind turbines can be very large. Some of them are the size of the Eiffel Tower and they have correspondingly deep foundations. And people use seismic data to try to, again, see hazards and try to locate these things safely. Key point here is that it's limited capability of dealing with any hazards within the first 200 to 100 meters because you don't have blowout preventers, you don't have circulating mud systems. So you need to avoid these hazards if you possibly can. And there are various specialist tools and techniques to enable you to do so. So a little bit about hazard identification. So you see these little bright events here on the seismic section. They're little shallow gas pockets. You really don't want to drill into one of those. And that's quite a slightly, significantly bigger shallow gas pocket, again, possibly associated with faults. And you can see a little bit of dimming below it due to uh, a lower frequency events due to absorption by the gas sand. Here's another seismic section with, again, possible anomalies, possible channels. Now, you don't know if these anomalies are real hazards, but you really don't want to find out. Other seismic sections showing uh, things like gas chimneys, which is a escape of gas going towards the surface, but stopping by, by a ceiling event. And then you have different attribute maps, different seismic attributes. Again, we use all of these techniques to try to identify what these hazards potentially might be. So the different types of shallow hazards. You've got shallow gas pockets, uh, generally within uh, sand bodies that are close to the surface, which have a seal, local seal. They may not have very high gas saturations, but you really don't want to drill into them. Shallow water flows are effectively submarine rivers. So if you've got a channel filled with sand, which has got potential uh, differences in pressure, water will flow through it. And again, you really don't want to hit one of those either. Uh, near surface channels, uh, there are also near surface channels that don't have shallow water flow. Less unpleasant, but again, you kind of want to be, stay away from them. Various seabed obstructions, both natural and man-made, uh, for example, pipelines, wrecks, etc. You don't really want to stay away from those. Ditto with faults. Ditto with abnormal pressures because you can't cope with them. You can cope with them deeper down, but you don't have any facilities to be able to cope with them at the very shallow levels. Uh, cast and carbonates, so that's very high porosity uh, in carbonate rocks, which will effectively uh, take away your mud system because you'll have flow into the, into the pores. Which is, uh, which is uncontrollable. Again, you want to stay away from that. So here's a nice diagram from Kyochi, Cateno and Ogeles from their paper, and this shows some of the features that are seen uh, that we have to avoid. So if you've got submarine canyons with the turbidite fans, so you've got sediment flowing down the canyon, again, you want to stay away from that. You've got pock marks, which are gas escape features. So that's gas escaping from the uh, subsurface uh, onto the surface. Uh, again, you want to stay away from that. Landslides, debris flows, etc. Want to stay away from that, etc. And the key thing is not just locating a well; it's also thinking about a development. There was a new ventures project I once looked at, which was a deep, uh, deep uh, sea field, which had a submarine canyon going uh, across the top of it. So you couldn't develop it from one uh, seabed manifold because you don't have any infill pipelines. You'd have to have two manifolds, maybe even two FBSOs big challenge. Also, if you've got a situation where you've got uh, a deep sea gas development, if you've got a big fault scarp, trying to get a pipeline across that is a bit of a challenge. There's a canyon flowing across where you need to get your pipeline. Again, you can't do that. So that's something we need to consider when we're looking at, the, at these things. A little bit about data availability. So you've got 2D and 3D data. So 2D data is effectively a grid of lines. So you can see there's an image behind there. Now with automatic contouring, you can produce an image, but it's not easily apparent. Uh, with 3D data, you effectively got these pixels. So each of these pixels is a 3D seismic bin size, typically about 25 meters squared, you know, 25 by 25, um, sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more. And you can see the image coming there, and then you can see that's what a perfect image would be like. So job is to interpolate from that to that. So these are examples in, uh, in the subsurface. You've got site survey 2D lines with high resolution. Now, people would use those because they would have finer sampling, higher frequency, 
and they'll be specifically aimed at looking at your top 300 meters or thereabouts. There's a big challenge if you got uh, in relatively shallow water, i.e. less than 100 meters, and you can't see the seabed properly, so you would tend to need that anyway. But again, looking especially reprocessed uh, seismic to try to get uh, details across. So what is shallow and why is this so important? So this is a typical well. So you would have two uh, strings within that. So the first is a 36 inch hole with a 30 inch conductor. So that's basically pile driven to about 100 meters. And then you drill the 24 inch hole, 24, uh, 20 inch conductor, 24 inch conductor, um, which again will be drilled to about 500 meters or thereabouts. And then you'll drill the well conventionally after that. So once these two uh, surface casings are installed, uh, you will then have your blowout preventer, you would have your mud system, so you take returns to surface, etc. But when you're doing that, you don't. So you really don't know what's down there. You're drilling very much blind. And there's not much you can do about it if anything happens. So you really want to have things as stable as possible. So workflows are shallow hazards. So the initial stage is initial reconnaissance. So this is what you would do while you're interpreting data, looking deeper down for actual prospects. You look for mapping your seabed, uh, basic seismic attributes near surface, very easy to do. Just identify any potential hazards, identify any pockmarks, identify any uh, um, canyons, anything else that really stands out. And also look at GIS and literature for man-made hazards. So for example, where the pipelines are, uh, where any wrecks are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just part of your initial reconnaissance. When you're planning a well, you've got a prospect, that's great. You're looking at site-specific prospect mapping. So you're looking at directly above where you're going to locate your well. You may reprocess data for specifically for shallow hazards, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. You may do additional extra seismic attributes, more detailed mapping, extracting voxel geobodies, see if anything extends and how far things extend. You may, once you've pretty much selected your well location, do extra service. So first of all, a, an inspection by a remotely operated vehicle of the seabed, just see what the heck's down there. Just with side scan sonar for any immediate seabed hazards. And you may do a specialist high resolution 2D lines with a spark, a boom, a ping, etc., just to make sure that they're there. And you have a detailed assessment. You have your hazard map, you have your 3D views, well plan and prognosis, and effectively communicate those risks to the people planning the wells. And this is a good example of a workflow, a paper by Cox, Knutz, Campbell and Cooper, looking at um, uh, potential well life site locations near Greenland and how they did it. So we'll recommend that paper to have a really good look at where things are. So you can also have dedicated seismic reprocessing. So this is from NCS Subsea. And this is looking at reprocessing data you already have for higher frequencies. So you look at the near offsets, you're trying to de-ghost, etc. And you can see the difference between this data set, which is um, relatively smooth, to this data set, which is um, more complicated. What you then have is also other forms of reprocessing. So this is from PGS. So this is their swim processing sequence, removing the acquisition footprint, uh, using specific, because the acquisition footprints are these um, horizontal lines, which are the lines of the sail direction, which make uh, things difficult to interpret. So you can see there's a little potential gas pocket here from this, uh, which is cut by the conformity at the seabed, which is difficult to see on uh, the conventional data, but somewhat easier to see on the reprocessed data. So that's from the PGS website. You can use different seismic attributes. So this is from Schlumberger's website. These are done in Petrel. So you look at, um, this is just basic bathymetry, basic interpretation. You can look at your curvature, which is a form of attribute looking at uh, faults. Uh, dip angle, which is uh, basically steep dips. Edge detection, looking for edges. Other things that are there are frequency. So effectively, you're looking for gas cores phased out. Reflection strength or envelope, which gives you really bright amplitudes. And voxel tracking is effectively you take a seed and you track a, um, a, a channel or another geo body to see how far it extends. Or so it's an automatic way of doing that. So you produce volume map visualization to put it all together. This is again also artificial interpretation. So this is uh, posted in, uh, in GeoExpro magazine uh, by Buango of, G of PGS, my former colleague James Selvage. 
So this is looking at making artificial horizons. Again, you're looking for hazards, and this process is automated so you can spot the things that other people can't. Another one is uh, mast amplitude. So this is by Virtual Seismic Reality, uh, Steve Lynch. So this is looking at this particular hazard. So you can see there's something bright here. You can see this big diffusion using the shallow because this anomaly is absorbing energy. So this will pop up also in the frequency plot. That's your seabed. Is this a gas hydrate? I don't know. So you can see there's a rather large channel with this body within it, um, but it's not that easy to see. So what Steve does is he does this alternative form of uh, uh, processing and visualization. Please check out his channel, Visual Seismic, uh, Virtual Seismic Reality. So you can see this bright event in here. It's in the blue spectrum, so it's kind of difficult for many people to see. But what Steve uses is a different type of color uh, processing uh, with uh, effectively a form of 3D texture. You can see this standing out really, really clearly. So what we really want for shallow hazards is boring data. We really don't want any excitement. We want nice, flat, parallel reflectors. No channels, no canyons, no scars, no debris floors, definitely no faults or mud volcanoes, and especially no indication of hydrocarbons. This can be challenging in some areas, some deep water areas, for example, offshore Egypt, offshore Nigeria, places I've worked which have these challenges. So just to sum up, shallow hazard analysis is vital for safely executing offshore wells. There are different types of hazards, different types of techniques that we need to use to spot these problems early, try to avoid them. We need to grow our awareness. A lot of geophysicists tend to concentrate very much on the prospects, and they tend to kind of skim through the overburden because it's kind of really boring, um, but it isn't. It's vital. And you need to effectively communicate with geologists and drillers. Put together hazard maps, look at where things are. And we're now also using the same techniques for offshore wind. There are some differences within that, but you're moving from old energy, oil and gas, to new energy, offshore wind. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.